It's part two of our super big listener mailbag coming up next on the Locked On Giants podcast. You are Locked On Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast family, your team every day. My name is Patricia Trena. Happy to have you with us. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day or your first watch of the day. Today's episode of the Locked On Giants podcast is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find candidates you want to talk to faster than ever before. Post your job for free today at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. All right, Giant fans, as promised, this is part two of our super huge, and I do mean huge, Giants mailbag. Yesterday, we were able to get about half of the questions that I received onto the program. Today, we're going to do the rest. So if you didn't catch your question yesterday, chances are it's going to be on today's program. And just as a reminder, certain questions uh, were duplicated. So, for example, I got a lot of questions about Kadarius Tony and why he didn't play as much. So I consolidated those to avoid having duplication. Otherwise, we've got a great lineup of questions. We've got about 12 on today's show. Let's get right to it. We're going to kick it off with Greg Reeves, who wants to know if Quincy Roche plays well, is there a chance that... Ellerson Smith gets cut or gets out in long-term IR. Greg, thank you for the question. My guess is no. I don't think the Giants are going to cut Ellerson Smith. I know injuries have been an issue with this young man, but you know what? They really like what he brings to the table. And, um, you know, remember, this coaching staff is on a, on a fresh start basis. In other words, whatever happened last year doesn't really matter. So as far as they're concerned, this is really the first time they're without Ellerson Smith, which they are. So, you know, Quincy Roche, I think the reason why he was the odd man out in the uh, outside linebacker room was more or less because maybe he wasn't as athletic as, say, an O'Shane Zimenez or an Ellerson Smith. So I don't see Smith getting tossed aside um, if, if Roche continues to play well. And then here's the other thing you got to remember, Roche is on the practice squad. So they've already used one of two allotted elevations for him. If they use the second one, um, then he becomes subject to waivers. And I know nobody picked him up off of waivers the first time around, but there's been some injuries that uh, have happened around the league. And who's to say that somebody won't poach Roche uh, if, if he's exposed to waivers uh, or even poach him from the practice squad. So, yeah, I, I don't see that happening. But thanks for the question. Appreciate it. All right. Let's go to the big blue. I think this is the big blue offense. Is Richie James for, for real? He looked to be open all day. Is this guy a sleeper on offense or what? Great question. Richie James is actually a pretty good receiver. Now, is he the type of receiver that's probably going to scare? Defensive coordinators, probably not. But Richie James has a knack for getting open, as you pointed out. Um, the scheme certainly helps. He's quick, he's shifty, and the guy has pretty good hands. Plus, he's he's uh, a good special teams guy. So you know, there's a lot to like about Richie James. But is he like a number one or a number two receiver or even a number three? I wouldn't go that far. I would say he's a solid depth piece who could do a lot of things and do a lot of things well. But, you know, if, if you're talking about like upper echelon receivers, not quite there yet. Um, but remember, Richie James is coming off of a, a injury year, the, the prior year with the 49ers. So he's still kind of getting his feet back underneath him. We'll see how he does the rest of the year, but certainly he can contribute to this offense. But um uh, probably not scare opposing defensive coordinators, like I said. So, all right, thanks for the question. 
Uh, the next question we have is from GPO Giants 1999. Do you think the conservative passing game shows that one, the coaches don't trust Jones, two, they don't trust the O line, three, it's too early to tell, or four, something else? Ooh, I like it. A, a multiple choice question. Um, I don't think it's a result of not trusting Jones. Um, I'll go, uh, I'll, I'll say that much. What I will say is basically, and, I, and I've said this going back to the, to the start of the season, the Giants passing game is a little bit behind the running game at this point. And I said way back when, and I'll say it again here, the running game is probably going to have to carry the passing game for a little bit until the O-line gels, until Daniel and his receivers settle in. And just everybody becomes comfortable with one another. So I think it's a combination of things. Um, it also could be based on, on the opponent. Now, Ed, granted, I was a little surprised that the Giants against the Titans didn't really exploit the, the cornerbacks all that much. I thought there, were, might, there might be a few more you know, deep balls thrown at the cornerbacks. I think there was only one deep pass thrown the entire game. Will that change moving forward? I would expect it to. But um, yeah, the passing game, I think, is still coming together. And uh, if it comes together as they expect it to, it's going to be beautiful to watch. I think you'll like it a lot. All right. Next question comes from AJ. Why haven't they fixed the issue of calling a screenplay than not having anyone blocking for the receiver? Okay, AJ, pretty much what I said in the last response the passing game, all elements of it, still coming together. You know, in this case, with the, with the screen game, you know, you need the offensive linemen to pull and get to their blocks and all that stuff. It's all coming together. Remember, this unit, you know, the, it's, it's, they're playing together like full time now for the first time all year. Whereas in the preseason, they had a few series here, a few snaps there. So you really can't go, you know, sit here and say, oh my God, the sky's falling when it comes to the screen game. I think that will come together with more reps and as they kind of, you know, get used to one another and playing together. All right, Giant fans, we have more coming up on this part two of our listener mailbag. We'll be right back with more of your questions right after this. Hey, business owners, as you gear up for fall, you need the right people on your team to help make your small business fire on all cylinders. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find those people that you want to talk to faster and for free. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Then add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring so that your network can help you find the right people to hire. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so that you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and who you'd like to hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. Post your job for free today on LinkedIn jobs. Go to linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. I'm Patricia Trana, your host. We are doing part two of our big mailbag. So I'm getting to the remaining questions that were sent to me. And um, again, if you missed part one, that dropped yesterday. So do check it out. And also on the Locked on Giants podcast today, we're scheduled to meet with uh, Brandon Olson, who you might know as the host of Locked on Gators. Brandon is also a Giants fan, um, works, uh, actually contributes for Giants to Giants Country, which is the uh, site where I do all my written work. So Br Brandon's going to join me. We're going to talk Giants. That should be fun. That show uh, is, is going to be out, if it's not out already, today. Then on Thursday, Julian Council, a host of Locked on Panthers, joins me as we bring you the crossover show. Everything you need to know about 
the Giants home opener this weekend against the Carolina Panthers. And on Friday, working to set up a live show with the Entertainer. So another, hopefully, episode of Trina and Tana for Friday. But now let's get back to your questions here on this part two of Twitter Tuesday. All right. Up next, we hear from Sergeant K. Gerard, uh, who asks, likelihood of Thibodeau and Ojulari playing against Carolina. As I record this, it's on a Tuesday, so I haven't been to practice yet for the week, haven't seen an injury report. But that being said, my guess is we will see one of them on Sunday, at least one of them. I don't know for sure that we'll see both of them, but I think one of them is a possibility. Which one you're probably wondering? My guess is it's going to be Thibodeau. I think he's going to be ready to go. Ojulari, I'm not so sure if he's going to be ready to rock and roll. But um, again, I'm kind of hedging my bets here because it is Tuesday and I don't really like to predict injury, you know, who's in, who's out due to injury until I see practice, until I get the injury report. But that would be my guess as of this particular juncture. So don't hold me to it if I'm wrong, but uh, I'm just going off of what I know as, to be true as of as this recording. All right, Panic City, please rank the top five or so quarterback prospects as of now for the upcoming NFL draft. All right, thanks for the question. Just a little heads up. I don't look at the NFL draft prospects until after the season's done. So I know some of the quarterbacks in this draft or who will be in this draft. I don't want to get into rankings right now because in all honesty, I don't really follow college football as closely as I probably should to make a ranking, you know, or an intelligent guess at a ranking. So I'm going to defer on this particular question. But if you'd like to ask me in January or whenever the season ends for the Giants and I start doing my homework on all these guys, I'll be happy at that point to give you a ranking. Plus, it'll be a little bit more current because these guys will have gone through an entire season and we'll know, you know, whose stock is up and whose stock is down. All right. Thanks for that question, though. We have, uh, let's see, Big Blues B, 14. Yeah, Big Blues B14 wants to know. Uh, I live in Maryland, so I only get four to five Giants games televised, two are against Washington football team. The others are Thursday, Sunday night, or Monday. I have no desire to get direct TV. Why won't the NFL allow some internet company to charge for each game or team? Um, can I refer you to one of two services that where you can get these games? Uh, you can try NFL Plus, which I think broadcasts the game the next day. Or if you got to see it while it's in, in real time, check out Fubo TV. I actually have a subscription to Fubo TV, which allows me to watch games out of my local market. So if I want to see, you know, if I want to tape, for example, uh, last week I wanted to tape the Carolina game. I was able to do that while, you know, also watching the Giant game. And I had it available to me, you know, just as soon as the game was over. So Fubo TV or NFL Plus would be my recommendation to get, you know, the games that you want to see. All right, Giant fans, we have a couple more on uh, this particular part two of uh, the Twitter mailbag. Again, I got a lot of questions, a lot of duplicates, so I tried to consolidate some of them. Um, but we have about four more questions to get to. We'll do those right after this. Hey, Giant fans, Bet Online is the only place that offers the best information on the latest odds, contests, and player props for all your sports betting needs. No matter what sport you're into, Bet Online has you covered. Plus, they offer everything you need to know for live betting and your favorite Vegas casino games. Head on over to Bet Online today to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. I'm Patricia Trana. We're wrapping up this week's big edition of Twitter Tuesday. Yep, on a Wednesday. Why not? We can break the rules. It's my show, right? I can break the rules sometimes if I want to. 
And uh, this is one of those times. So uh, we're getting to all your questions that you sent in. And now we're turning to the questions that I received via uh, email. So let me uh, go to those. And by the way, if you want to send in a question to the mailbag, the information is in the show notes. You can tweet them to me um, at Patricia underscore Trena. You can email them to me at Locked on Giants podcast at gmail.com. All the information is in the show notes, like I said. Um, so feel free to, to send in your questions and we'll get them on the show because that's why I do this for you guys. So thank you for listening. Um, all right, let's get to these last few questions. Scott wants to know, uh, if I remember correctly, the contract for vets are fully guaranteed if you sign them before week one. After week one, they are not guaranteed. So that's when there might be lots of veteran free agents get inked to the deal. Is that still the case? If so, who might we expect the Giants to sign? Scott, to my knowledge, that is still the case. Regarding who might we expect the Giants to sign, the team doesn't have a whole lot of cap space, Scott, so I don't know if they're going to go crazy with signing guys. Um, the Giants, you know, I think they have about, I want to say $5 million or so in cap space, so I would go crazy with, with the, you know, signing guys just for the sake of signing guys. Now, if somebody's injured or somebody just flat out is awful, then I could see them making a move. But I don't think Joe Shane's going to continue to flip the roster around as much as he would if he had a little better uh, salary cap situation to, to work with. So thanks for the question. All right. Um, this next question, gosh, I cut off who it was sent by. I apologize to whoever this was who sent this question in, but uh, let me read it. It says, I saw Sunday's Jets game at MetLife. Ravens cornerback Fuller tore his ACL and OT James injured his Achilles. What are your thoughts on the Giants players wearing sneakers on the MetLife turf rather than cleats? Do you think this might reduce the risk of serious injuries? Ooh, throwback to the sneakers game, huh? Um you know what, there, there's kind of a reason why players wear cleats and even on, you know, the artificial turf or the field turf, at the, as is the case here. And that is to give them better footing because, you know, cleats will allow you to really stick your foot in the ground and pivot or push off and whatnot. And yes, you're, you know, there, there might be instances where, where the turf is so spongy and it can, you know, it can catch your foot, but I don't think sneakers is going to make a difference. I mean, you know, injuries are going to happen. And I know everybody wants to blame the field turf. But folks, the Giants aren't the only ones who use field turf. It's used by about 10 other NFL teams and that don't have the injury issues the Giants have. So could we please stop blaming the turf? Football is a violent game. It's a game that requires the body to make sudden twists and turns. Injuries are going to happen. They stink. I get it. You know, you don't want to see it happen, but they're going to happen. And the best you can do is just hope that they won't happen. You hope that, you know, nobody's going to tear an ACL or pop an Achilles. And, you know, is there a deeper um physical reason behind popping in Achilles, you know, like, for example, maybe not stretching or something like that. I don't know. I'm not a sports scientist, but I do know that, you know, the Giants in particular, who were the most injured team last year in the NFL, they have done a lot of work on trying to solve this injury issue. But at the end of the day, like I said, injuries are just going to happen. Broken bones, what have you, they're going to happen. So the idea hopefully is to reduce some of these soft tissue injuries, the hamstrings, you know, the, uh, the groin injuries, you know, that sort of thing, the concussions, you'd like to try and solve some of those if you can. So, you know, we'll see what they come up with as they go, continue to move forward. All right. Tyler Jones comes up with a question. He, ha he asks, um, now that we are officially into the season, what grades would you give the Dable Shane off season performance? The draft, salary cap, free agency, training camp. 
You know what, Tyler? It all kind of runs together. So I don't think we can fully grade the off season until we get through to the regular season, because I think it's just too premature to say that. Um, same thing with the draft. You got to see how these guys play out this year. Um, free agency, same thing. Salary cap, you know, Shane inherited a mess. We all know that. He did the best he could with what he had. But, you know, it, it, I think Shane will be the first to tell you that in a perfect world, that wouldn't have been good enough for him. So, you know, I think, it, I think it's hard to grade you know, the individual segments. I think that's something that has to be done at the end of the year when we see, you know, what is the team's record? How have they looked? Who's developed? Who's regressed? You know, who might be part of the, the, the picture moving forward and so on and so forth. So um, that'll be an interesting exercise though, Tyler, and I'll be happy to do that at the end of the year. But right now, I, I just think it would be incomplete to, to, uh, to do that at this point. All right, I think we have one more question. Yep, we do. And this is from Stephen S., who uh, actually this, this was in response to the Giants Country mailbag, but I'm going to include it because um, it has to do with injuries. And he goes, this is specifically about concussions. Can you explain what being in the protocol means exactly? Can you tell me how it is determined during a game to remove a player for, for a concussion? And can you comment your opinion as to why seemingly much larger helmets are not doing their jobs? All right, thank you for the question, Stephen. Let's, let's take um, one at a time. Being in the protocol simply means that the league has a, I think it's a five-step concussion protocol that once a player is diagnosed with a concussion, he's got to pass each one of the five steps before he's clear to return for contact in the game. So um, off the top of my head, I'm just trying to think if I can remember what the five steps are. Actually, let me look it up and I'll see if I can give you that. I think I remember seeing a, um, a graphic. All right, so the five steps of the concussion protocol, according to the league's uh, return to protocol, I'm sorry, return to participation protocol chart is, uh, let me see, step one is symptom limited activity, which is basically the player rests and avoids any kind of activities while he has symptoms of the concussion, dizziness, headaches, nausea, whatever the case may be. Step two is aerobic exercise. That's when the player, you know, starts to feel better and he starts to reacclimate himself to doing physical stuff. Um, Step three is football specific exercise. So this is basically doing your non-contact type of, uh, I'm sorry, this is basically doing cardiovascular exercises that mimic sports specific activities, such as running, strength training, that sort of thing. Um, the player can also practice with the team in sports specific exercise for about 30 minutes or so, no more than 30 minutes. Well, while being carefully monitored. Step four of the protocol is club-based non-contact training drills. So that's the non-contact practice part where the guys are in a red jersey. And then step five is uh, full football activity and clearance. So basically they have to pass um, some neurological tests. It is done by an independent neurological consultant assigned to the club. And uh, they have to agree that the player is in no further danger of, you, you know, from the previous concussion of anything else happening. So that's the five-step protocol, uh, Stephen, regard, you know, that, that you often hear uh, reporters and, and teams mention. All right. How is it determined during a game to remove a player? Simply put, if a player gets his bell rung and he gets up slowly or he's walking like he's, you know, drunk or tipsy. That's usually a good sign that something's up. Um, it's also up to his teammates to kind of keep an eye on everybody. You know, if you see something, say something, basically. So, if, again, if a guy gets dinged and he gets up and he's, you know, shaking his head or going like this, you know, hitting the side of his head, 
kind of to clear the cobwebs, usually that's a sign that the guy got his bell rung. All right. Now, your your other question was why the much larger helmets are not doing their jobs. You know what, Stephen, I, I honestly think you could wrap a person's head up in layers of bubble wrap and it still wouldn't do the job. You know, the body is not meant for the type of impact that is common in the NFL. So larger helmets, smaller helmets, it doesn't really matter. If you get your head smashed against the ground, you're going to feel it. And it doesn't matter what kind of helmet, doesn't matter what kind of protection you have, doesn't matter what kind of padding you have, you're going to probably get your bell rung. It's just the way it is. Our heads were not meant to be hit in any way, shape, or form. So while the helmets obviously provide a layer of protection, nothing is foolproof, unfortunately. So that would be my guess. And again, I'm not a sports scientist. I'm, I, I don't know, you know, the finer points of, of, you know, physiology or anything like that. But that would be my guess um, to respond to your question. So thank you. That was a different question, an interesting question. Hope uh, I gave you something to, to chew over. All right, Jane fans, that is going to do it for this part two of the Twitter mailbag. Hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Thank you for, for sending in your questions. And for those of you who didn't get your name called today, check out yesterday's show. Maybe I answered your question yesterday. And if you still don't hear your name, chances are you might have asked a question that was already covered because I did get a lot of similar questions about, you know, the game plan, about Kadarius, Tony and whatnot. And I just didn't want to repeat the questions over and over again, wanted to get right to the heart of things. So, but I still, I appreciate you writing in and hope you will continue to tune in to the Locked on Giants podcast. Lots more still to come. So until next time, everybody, thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you tomorrow.